Sylvia and me. 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 Hi, I'm Sylvia Beckerman, host of the podcast series, Sylvia and May, conversations with extraordinary, inspiring women. Good morning, I'm Teresa Carroll. Welcome to Sylvia and Me. Teresa, thank you so much for being with me today. And of course, we are social distancing. You're in Greenwich, Connecticut. Yes, we are. Yes, we are, and I'm in Fairfield, Connecticut. We just wanna make that you know, clear to anyone who's listening. Um, one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about and why I found you so interesting is because you, yes, interesting, um, you are a, uh, a co-owner of a luxury boutique hotel and a, an award-winning, um, internationally known restaurant. It's the Homestead Inn and, and Henkelman. Can you tell me, so that was uh, back in 1997 when you uh, acquired this property. Right. Why did you go into the hospitality um, industry and um, how did you do it? Well, my father had been a restaurateur for some, you know, for some time when I was growing up and I always enjoyed it. It was a very, he had a steakhouse, Mr. Kelly's. It was a, a terrific place. And I just always loved it. Um, you know, my degree from college was in political science and international relations. So was mine. Was it really? Okay. Yes. And what do you do with that? <laughs> what do you do with <laughs> Going that? to insure? I don't know. Well, you can go to law school, but actually when I was in school, law school was a very difficult thing for women to do. So, and I was raised in an era where women were educated to be good wives, mm -hmm. to be supportive of their husband's career. That never sat well with me because I had a brain, I had ability, but then I had a lot of children. And by the time I figured out that women could really do something because national organization was founded two years after my first child. And it was like, oh, <laughs> I actually could have done something. Okay. So I raised my family and adored every minute of it, loved it, was very involved in their lives. But by the time my youngest was in maybe third or fourth grade, I thought, I need to do something. I don't want to sit at home all day and I'm tired of doing laundry and I'm tired of just being, but I still want to be a good mom. So I went into business for myself. Um, I had a casting company in New York. I cast commercials for years and loved that creativity. And I had acted previously. I'd been doing commercials for a number of years on camera. And I didn't have any great talent, but I had, I was lucky. Cars downsized and models couldn't do them anymore. <laughs> so <laughs> they needed shorter people. <laughs> It didn't giraffe the car, so I went into that business, and I, I absolutely adored it because I adored watching people with this passion. They had passion for what they were doing. They had theater dust in their veins. I never had that. That was never my, my thing. I was capable of doing it. I did it, and I was fine on camera. I mean, they had a passion for it and did that for any number of years while my kids were in school because I could then be home, cook dinner, and be with my family. Well, that's that's one of the things that being a mom, we always think about. Um, right. You know, I was a single mom, so I didn't, you know, it, it was a little bit different, but you want to, you know, try to have some kind of career or work um, that can fit into Right. your responsibilities of also being a parent. So go on. So when did you find your passion or, you know, did you have a journey looking for it? Yeah, no, I did have a journey looking for it. Um, I found a, a location and a business that I loved on, on Greenwich Avenue in Greenwich, Connecticut, and really, really wanted to do it. And then I started doing the business plan and I thought, you know, I don't know that this is going to work. Parking was a problem. You know, I just didn't know. 
And what it had been had only attracted daytime business. And I thought, well, you're not going to make any money on lunch. And so I, I chose not to do that, but I kept my eyes open and then met um, Thomas Henkelman, who is uh, my partner. And he's a world-class master chef. So it sort of alleviated that portion of the of the chemistry of what you need in hospitality. Okay. And other than my father's restaurant, you know, hospitality was sort of not anathema to me, but it was something I didn't know. I didn't know well, but I knew I was suited for it. I'm from Michigan originally. And so was raised with a very Midwestern ethos and culture. And so we like people from, you know, people from the Midwest actually like people. So we like to talk. We like to say hi. We like to find out about somebody. And I'm really very interested in people. I think that 99% of the people you meet have something to offer. That's very and true. you learn. Yes. You learn from them. And I love learning. And so, you can have an open mind. Yeah. Well, and... I just plain like people. I enjoy being around them. I enjoy my solitude as well, but I really do enjoy being around people. So Thomas and I sat down and we did a business plan and we were looking for properties, but the business plan was in place. It was the numbers that needed to be run when we found the particular place. We knew what we needed, wanted to do, how we were going to do it and sort of the vicinity. We didn't want to go into the city. And Thomas is, um, yeah, I mean, he's, he's a grand chef. He, he was in the city. He was at Maurice at the Parker Meridian, was the executive chef. He was brought over from Europe by Mark Haberlin, or um, Paul Haberlin, the father, who was the first three-star Michelin chef in the world. Okay. So, yeah, or in France. I'm sorry, in France or in Europe. France. Yes. And, you know, so th the idea to have somebody like that was pretty exciting. So we ended up finding uh, the property okay. in Greenwich, Connecticut. It's a, you know, it's a gorgeous property. It is. It has four, you know, four separate buildings. The main, the main building or the manor house has the restaurant and eight rooms upstairs, nine rooms upstairs. The carriage house has eight rooms and suites and the cottage, which has a boardroom and then another guest room. And then we have a barn and three acres of property, almost three acres of property. So we then set about finding investors. You know, we could do part of it, but we couldn't do all of it. So we found our investors and boy, were we fortunate. Boy, oh boy, were we fortunate. We've all been together now about 24, 25 years doing this. And they're brilliant. And we, we actually work with two of them. There's a, a group of 11 that sort of formed a syndicate. At, but we, and they all have different percentages. Um, but the two that we, that we work with were... Uh, global bankers, but in the banking sense, right. and knew their stuff. They had worked with Paul Volcker to clean things up for the country. I mean, they're good. <laughs> they're good. <laughs> Sounds like it. Working, working with them was like getting a PhD. Um, I learned more about that kind of finance and high-end finance and I will not ever claim to truly understand it or even like it, but you need to know it. And it, it took a long time. I mean, it was a tough road to hoe. And wow. my, my side's more creative. <laughs> That's well, I, I know that. And we'll get into that in a second, but I wanted to go back to what you just said is the fact that you might not understand all of it, but you knew you needed to know it. Yep. And that's one of the things that women have, you know, uh, going back in the 70s, women yeah. weren't allowed to do anything without a male cosigner or anything. Right. 
And even to this day, um, the stats are uh, astounding where so many women still leave all of the financials to their male partner because, right. you know, it, it's kind of the way um, we were brought up. Well, some of us were not no, necessarily in, in, in my uh, family because my mother was really um, at the forefront of, you know, she raised five, I almost said eight children. Now she raised five children in eight years. And right. then when she was in her forties, went to college and in eight years got her PhD. Wow. So, you know, that's the kind of, you know, era that I was, you know, brought in with that. But women, we, you know, we really relegate um, some things you know, and it could be because we're just, we have so much on our plate. So well, we I were also raised in a patriarchy. Excuse we me? had no option. We were raised under right. a patriarchy. We had no options. Okay. They so, weren't available. But you knew, you had the business sense to know that you might not be able to understand all of it, but you needed to know. Absolutely. Which is Absolutely. so important. It's so been invaluable. To, yes, totally. So let's get back to the fun part. Okay. All right, you you um, you created a European inspired property. Right. Um, where did this creativity come from, and was there any any particular property or anything that inspired you to to make this absolutely dreamy um, environment? I was very fortunate. I traveled a lot. Oh. Oh, I meant to turn this off. Shoot, That's sorry. Right. No problem. Uh, let me turn it down so it won't go off again. Oh, shoot, okay. Um, sorry. sorry. Anyway, I traveled a lot, spent a lot of time in France, a lot of time in Italy, more time in France probably than any place else, Italy and Germany. And I love food, so I ate everywhere. <laughs> And I watched everything. And there were things that I just adored and wanted that, that ambiance, but perhaps without the same European formality, because I also am American and I understand what Americans like and what they don't like. Americans don't dine for hours. They just, they don't like waiting between courses. They don't like, you know, they want it lickety split. So I had to incorporate all of that into the service, the kind of service that we gave. You know, design, I was a designer as well while I, while I was raising my children. I'd been okay. in the And I love it. I have personally my own bent and what I like, but I can do whatever anybody needs or did do whatever anybody needs. And I enjoy it. I love I just put myself there. And for me, our property is like a big outfit. You go to your closet, you pull together the top, the pants, the dress, the jacket, the shoes, the purse, and the gloves, whatever you're going to do. And you know what colors work for you. You know what colors work in general. And my, my forte, as it were, my forte, is color. I love color. I love Why? deep gem tones. Yes. But tertiary. I don't want them to scream in your face. I don't want it to be a bright anything. I want it to blend. Mm -hmm. And I think I accomplished that at the property. Also, because I was able to travel, the property is very eclectic. It looks like Courier and Ives on the outside, but it doesn't inside. It's a real blend of the old, the new, the foreign, the domestic, what have you. I've got architectural pieces of furniture. I've got Asian, certainly a lot of Asian because I enjoy it. Um, I have French. I have just about everything. So blending. Well, that's one of the things that, that the Homestead Inn is, is known for. I mean, uh, you know, um, anyone, a, a, any of the reviews speak to that. Oh, that's nice, thank you. So you're a, you're 
a full time working. You're building this this um, this boutique hotel and restaurant, mm -hmm. and you also are a mom. How right. did you? How were you able to incorporate um, what passion? Because it sounds like this is your passion. That's a passion. And how were you able to incorporate that in in um, you know, raising a family? Well, I didn't have to. My son, my youngest child that I started working when he was in maybe third or fourth grade, mm -hmm. left for college the month that we opened the property. Okay. So I never felt that empty nest. I missed him terribly, but I was busy. I, mean, I was terribly busy. Because for the first six years, I didn't take a day off. I was there seven days a week for long hours. Okay. Not because it was a learning curve. There were things I just didn't, it was, I was surprised. I, every day I was surprised by something. And I had to figure it out. How did this work? I made mistakes. You but know, we, was, have to, we have to make mistakes. Otherwise, yeah. we'll never know. If, if you go through life, perfect, which I don't believe in that, um, right. and you never make mistakes, you never know what could be better. Right, absolutely. Um, so uh, the timing, time is, is everything. Right. And the timing of you being able to start living your passion was perfect. That yeah, it really was. was. Yeah, it was. It was sort of divine timing. It just happened that way. Now you're a um, you're a woman in business, right? With a business that is award winning, a business that at at that time was just being built. As you said, for the first six years, you didn't take a day off. Right. How how did you find that as a woman in the hospitality industry? Um, you have your investors, which you you know you you say are a dream. Um, was there any difficulty that you might have come across uh, up against, you know, being a woman in, in business? Yeah, being listened to. <laughs> Bingo. How did oh, you, so very, how did you get around that? How did you? I still am not around it. Okay. I'm still not around it. It's, it's very difficult. If I make a query, very often it is, a roll of the eyes, like, how could you not know that? Um, that's why I'm asking, because I don't know it, and I'd like to understand it. So there's a, a real, I find a real lack of intolerance at times with questioning mm -hmm. what anyone's doing. And it isn't saying they're wrong. It's just let me understand it. Exactly. Um, you know, and I really don't like, I, I don't want to bash, but it's part of the, the culture that I grew up in. And I'm dealing with people that are my age, you know, maybe a couple of years older. And they're not changing. <laughs> they're not. They're not. They're not. They're not. Younger people are. I think it's, uh, I think it's still there. Like for my, my kids' age, they're all in their 40s. Mm-hmm. Um, I see a huge difference with the, the parenting, with the lots of things that are going on, that there's a lot more interaction with fathers and their children, with, you know, with women going out to work, making money. But it's, it's a tough road to hoe. It's still not, it's still not where we need it to be. It's no. still as, as a woman, we're fighting this on, on so many levels. Well, and very and, often it's subliminal. Oh, yes. <laughs> and they think it's in our head. Yeah. Um, you yeah. know, <laughs> and, and, and one of the things that, you know, I, is when one of the strengths that people don't understand is one, asking questions. Yeah. If you don't know something, ask. If ask. you need help, ask. It's not a weakness. It just no. shows, it shows actual intelligence because you're smart enough and you have enough 
self esteem to be able to put out there and say, I don't know this, or I need help or, with this. And, or and just explain to me what it is you're trying to do. You mean like one and one equals two and don't make it into this whole dissertation where, you know, I right. always said something like, uh, like in insurance, it was always, well, this is included, but not this, and this is included, and this is not included, but this is included. And, and it goes on and on and on. They call it legalese and whatnot, where the bottom line is, oh, wait a minute, it's this and not that. And right. when you ask a question, you know, they want to, so many times they just want it to sound more complex than it is. Well, that's why they say there's no stupid questions. There's a lot of stupid answers. Yep. Again, bingo. And bingo. as you know, I see women more, what we're, what women are doing more than they did before is they're, they're learning to put themselves out there and ask. Right. Um, we've always asked for directions, at least I have. Um, and, and, and that's how we get conversation because when you ask for something, when you, when you ask for something to be explained and say, you don't know something, right. you might actually know more than you think. And you might be able to tell the person who's explaining it to you, oh, so you could say it this way or right. wait a minute. We know it in a different framework. Right. Or we might know something in addition to that and be able to tell them something that they didn't. Oh, gee, you mean add to the, <laughs> add to the conversation? <laughs> oh, you're, you're, you're a dream. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. It's so, you know, I, I've worked in, in industries that have always been, um, you, you know, they're, they're a man's world. Uh, and, yeah. and I just... You know, I found that if I boiled something down to the one and one equals two or two and two equals four, right. they'd get their backs up because yeah. their whole hold, and for some women they do this too, but their whole hold was on what they thought was the complexity of whatever they were doing. And exactly. Remember when women started dressing like men for work because they were going into the workforce? Yes. They'd wear a navy blue suit. They'd have a little or something around the right. neck so that looked like a tie. You know, I guess it's a baby step, except it was so unattractive and women had to be very assertive, which was called aggressive. Yes. Not yes. assertive. No, we it was aggressive. aggressive. We were aggressive. We weren't assertive. We were aggressive. Yes, we were really stepping over the line. <laughs> um, it, boy, it's been an interesting time to be a woman because we're groundbreaking we are certainly i feel like we did for my i, I did for my children mm -hmm. i raised them with a very different ethos than i was raised with mm -hmm. and they in turn have moved that forward with their families and are raising them with a very different ethos uh you know women have been contributing for generations for centuries <laughs> right. without, any, without any credit and very often women are the power, but have never been given any credit. Exactly, exactly. And, and, and this isn't, I'm not male bashing. What no, I am, but that, you see, that's how I always, I always have a disclaimer. Yeah. It's not, it's not male bashing. What it is, is women taking, taking the respect for themselves. Absolutely. Forward. Absolutely. Um, that's, the learning curve that we are not subservient. You know, we have different roles, but the roles could be changed. You know, right. um, you know, there there are stay-at-home dads. There are yes. stay-at-home moms. There are, you know, there are, are so many different roles. And 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 the thing is that we don't have to be stuck in what was. Right. We, we need to be able to move forward and do, to be able to move forward without the animosity and without being called aggressive and other right. things, um, right. you know, and, and, and that's, and we don't need to scare anyone. And it's really funny when you think about male aggression, it's leaning in it's, <laughs> or yes. you know, this, 
Women don't do that. No. Women don't do that. Most women don't do that. Yeah, I mean, what we're talking about is in general terms. We're not right. talking that, right. you know, not everyone fits. But you know. it's, it's the intimidation factor and the bullying. And I think a lot of men that really probably are not innately bullies have been raised to think that that's the only way they can do it. You see, the other thing is, is that, you know, in talking about that, there are some women who, when you talked about women dressing, you know, in men's right. clothing, you know, in, in, not in men's clothing, but in men's right. fashion, right. Um, there are some women who think that's how they need to be because right. they've seen the men do it and they'll do it to other women. Right. Because that, that, that um, balance is not there. Right. It's and skewed. It, it's, it's, it's really disheartening when right. you see that. And I think, you know, women like you, um, you know, who can understand and not be afraid to ask and have a very, very successful, right. um, a, you know, well-known awarded uh, business in, in a business that is so competitive and yeah, tough. You know, hospitality, you know. Hospitality uh, is tough. You have to love it. It has to be a passion. It has to be a passion. I don't know if I could smile at everyone. <laughs> That's not a problem. That's not a problem. I think the thing that was a problem for me was the lack of family time that I could comfortably give mm -hmm. when my kids came home. It's, because it's, it was always our busiest time of the year yep. or it was our whatever. So th that was difficult. But you seem to, uh, you know, you've talked about your children. Uh, somehow you found a way to um, meld it so that you, you yeah. know, you're putting in, listen, you know, we do what we can. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure, you know, your children have been brought up. They understand this is your passion. And they really are not, um, I'm not putting words in your mouth. Maybe I am. It, you know, they, they, they are probably proud of mom. You know what? They're very proud of me, which is wonderful because when they were younger and I was working and, you know, I was in the city, um, I missed a lot of games, a lot of their sports, or I missed whatever, anything that happened during the day. And they didn't like that. They, you know, the other moms are all there. Well, we're the other dads. No, and I asked them that. I said, were the other dads there too? No. Well, no, the dads don't come. And I said, well, that's unacceptable. Yes. Listen, you know, I went through that. Uh, I was a single mom since 1988. And, yeah. you know, especially in, you know, little, little New England towns, um, right. you know, very few at that particular time there, you know, there were all the nuclear families, mom, dad, mm -hmm. two children, a dog or two dogs, you know, right. we didn't get a dog for a while. But it's, it's, you know, it's tough. It's really, we do what we can. Right. Um, and then we make sure, you know, they're able to get the therapy they need afterwards. <laughs> Well, I, I tell my children all the time, I said, you know what, I tried to cripple you emotionally from the time you were born, and it didn't work, because I have these extraordinarily strong, independent children. Yes. And, and, and accomplished, and really accomplished. And, so. and, and that's really because it's who we are, and right. that's what we then give to our children. So as much as we're feeling guilty throughout the whole time, well, you know what? Our children are doing fine. They're, they're thriving. They're having their own families. They're moving on. And they're living a life that, you know, hopefully we gave them the yep. beginning and the moral, eth you know, and the ethics. And, and they're taking that and they do what they want to do with that. And they find their own passion. Yeah. Yeah, and because I, you know, one of the things with my kids is that when they were being raised, if they did something wrong, they had to step up to the plate. I didn't make excuses for them. They had to take responsibility for it. And it was character building. 
they didn't like it because other parents would step in and I wouldn't. And I didn't do it because I didn't love them. I did it because I loved them. Exactly. Because I wanted them to be whole, happy, healthy adults that had integrity, that had values, that had character. It was just too important. And see, that's another thing that, that we can, uh, you know, that people can say, ah, oh, you know, look at her. She doesn't, she, she really doesn't care. She's not doing, you know, why isn't she jumping in? Why isn't she saving her child? Why isn't she, you know, fighting, you know, right. that's the, what, first of all, people shouldn't, you know, you, you never know what's going on. And the other thing right. is, is I think, um, you know, I always knew that I would jump in when needed. Right. But they needed to fight their own battles, stick right. up for themselves, figure out what they did wrong. Um, but they, they, their safety net was knowing that when push came to shove. You were there. Yeah. I was yeah. their advocate. Yeah. But I wasn't their savior for, for everything in life. Well, I wasn't their litigator. Oh, I like that. Okay. It's, you know, what is this? It's the beginning of a three-day weekend. I can't think of big words like that. <laughs> we're, we're, we're on vacation from, um, you know, some of the other things that I wanted to go into. So you have had a very, very successful um, career, living your passion, going through, you know, a, a learning curve, which I'm sure there are still things that, well. If I don't continue learning, it's all over. We're in the midst of a pandemic. And, yeah. you know, for, uh, we are actually recording this. Um, we're having this conversation on the Saturday before Memorial Weekend of, you know, 2020. In the midst of this pandemic, this crisis, where you know, some businesses, some places are just sort of reopening, some life is just maybe reopening, and we're all in an unknown path. Right. Um, a, a, a couple of things, you know, how do you see, you know, what do you think about this gradual opening and how do you see it, uh, it going? Uh, you know, you're in the hospitality industry, which has been hit tremendously hard it has. by this pandemic. It has. There's, I have no control over coronavirus. None of us do. So I leave that alone. What I have control over is how I respond. And my response is, is that people's lives are far more important than my making money. It's not that I wouldn't like to, but I'm not gonna jeopardize myself or anyone else to do it unsafely. It's difficult because there are, are truly economics involved and it impacts everyone. We will reopen and I'm very concerned about that. I'm very concerned, you know, I see people now in, for the last week because we were ready to reopen. Right. When I drive somewhere, if I have to go to the grocery store, they're not social distancing. They, they're wearing masks, sort of in a half-baked way. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I feel like a lot of people put their hands over their eyes like a toddler thinking the virus can't see them. Well, the virus can see you. It's a mesma. It's there. It's everywhere. And we need to deal with it. We need to deal with it responsibly. So we're going to deal with it responsibly. Okay. You know, I was thinking actually before we, before we came on that when people start coming back to the restaurant, uh, we don't need just the name of the reservation. We need the name of every person and a contact number. Very true. Because we need to be able to contact trace. 
or the whoever is doing the contact tracing needs to do that. Exactly. This thing is very, very scary. And it's very invasive. It's invasive of personal space. It's invasive of what it's invasive of just about everything. Life. Of life yeah. as we've known it. Life is, well, we're going into a whole new world. Yes, we are. A whole new world. And I think it's a world that 10 years from now, we won't recognize exactly just how profound it's been. I think there are lots of institutions that are going to crumble, not do well. Um, and I think it's up to each one of us individually to forge our path responsibly, with character, with ethics, and with empathy. I fully agree. Um, I like how you're approaching it because yeah. it is it it's it is about us, um, and it is about really not just protecting ourselves, right. but not putting other people in harm's way when it's not necessary to. When taking well, the precautions, you know, is is to me the smart thing to do, right? And it's and, not me; it's we. Yes, we. It is. It's we. It's we. It has. You know, I think this has brought together more people in thinking of a we than a me, 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 and and yeah. and and you know, oh, woe is me. It's it's a we thing. Um, no, it's not woe is me. And I hope people don't feel that way. Yes, it's very uncomfortable to say, oh my God, how am I going to pay for everything that I've been paying for, for, you know, and being comfortable with it for years? How am I, that's a horrible position to be in for anybody and to have that kind of strain. But there are people out volunteering. There's people feeding other people. There's people cooking every day so that other people will be able to eat. It's done through synagogues. It's done through churches. It's done through all sorts of organizations. There's a lot of empathy that's moving through. And I read something very interesting the other day. There are people that are humbled. And there are people that will be. Yeah. It's a whole new reality. Yeah. For a lot of people, um, it's a whole new reality. Well, it's a way to figure out what you really value and who. What's important? I couldn't agree more. Teresa, this has been wonderful. Um, oh, you, thank you. I've enjoyed it. I, I I think you're you know you're a woman who 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 goes after what she wants in a way that has brought joy to other people. I, you know, um, as I said, uh, your hotel, your luxury hotel, and and the restaurant, it gives pleasure and and joy to so many people. Um, and and it's you know it's a beautiful place. Thank you. Um, so. Thank you so much. Um, before I leave, what is the um, web address of the of Homestead Inn? www.homesteadinn.com and reservations can be made online through OpenTable, through any of the reservation systems online for the hotel. So it's a, it's a joy. Well, this has been lovely. Thank you so much. You can find us on all of your popular podcast platforms. And of course, our website, sylviame.com. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay tuned. <laughs>